Yeah. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. I was looking for a new video to debunk and decided to see what our old friends at Genesis Apologetics had been up to. There were two recent videos, one about human evolution and one about dinosaurs. Well, I'm going to let Gutsick Gibbon handle the former, but I'm here for the latter. And also, let me say this video was uploaded at 29.97 FPS. If you're out there making videos, never use 29.97 FPS, just use 24, 25, 30, or 60 FPS. There is no reason to use this not quite 30 FPS unless you're broadcasting color TV in the United States. But what do you expect? Creationists, it seems, can't get anything right. Anyway, let's see what Dan Biddle and friends have for us this time. Natural history museums spend millions on displays that promote the idea that an asteroid impact hitting the edge of the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico 66 million years ago was responsible for the final dinosaur extinction. While evolutionists have published over 90 different theories about this dinosaur extinction event, the asteroid theory takes the leading place in museums today. I'm not sure why there's such an emphasis on how much a museum display costs, although the one shown here didn't look like it was more than a few tens of thousands of dollars. But yes, like everything in science, the question of what killed the non-avian dinosaurs and most other things at the end of the Cretaceous has been explored in every available way. That's how you do science. You test every possibility that seems reasonable until one of them ends up doing the best to retrodict past data and predict future data. As it turns out, right now we know that around the end Cretaceous there was a huge impact event near what is now the Yucatan, and that there is a worldwide deposit of iridium, which is common in asteroids, but not on Earth. And at that point, we see the abrupt transition from the Mesozoic fauna of the Cretaceous to the Cenozoic fauna of the Paleogene. Other factors may well have been at play, but it seems like the impact was the big boy in terms of what caused this mass extinction. But have you considered how this single event could explain the simultaneous extinction of all dinosaurs around the world, including a massive dinosaur kill zone in North America that spans three countries and 14 states, stretching over 1,800 miles long and 1,000 miles wide? Well, first, the extinction probably wasn't simultaneous in the sense that it would have taken a single day. I'm sure some organisms clung on for a few months, maybe even a few years. Heck, it wouldn't really be all that shocking to find a few small non-avian dinosaurs had clung on into the Paleogene, although we have no such fossils. And no, the asteroid did not result in any massive dinosaur kill zones. I don't even know what we're talking about here. No one is seriously suggesting that the fossils we have from the Cretaceous were directly caused by the asteroid, with a possible few exceptions. Virtually no fossils are of animals directly killed by the Chicxulub impact event at the end of the Cretaceous. Over a million square miles across the American West are filled with every- Hold up. What is that? That's the Allosaurus from Ark Survival Evolved. Why are we using a cartoonishly bad reconstruction of a dinosaur that lived in the Jurassic period that ended some 79 million years before the Cretaceous even started when we're talking about the end Cretaceous? Once again, Creationists can't get anything right. Over a million square miles across the American West are filled with every kind of dinosaur, and they're all mixed with other land animals. I guess that's just what we're going to do then. Mix up the Maastrichtian stage of the Cretaceous with just all of the Mesozoic. Great. Let's just hear them out. Including birds and all sorts of marine life, like clams, rays, and sharks. Okay, I was curious about these maps, and since Genesis Apologetics was so kind as to credit the creator of them, that is, Stam and Design, who in fact do make some pretty cool maps, I was able to find out how they got these. These maps are from paleodb.org, where there is a navigator. I managed to generate this exact map. You know what that's a map of? Every single dinosaur in the area shown from the entire Mesozoic, birds included. Seriously, you select the filters Mesozoic and Dinosauria, and that's what pops up. So right now, Genesis Apologetics is trying to say that scientists think that the Chicxulub impactor killed every dinosaur we have ever found across the whole of the Mesozoic, a time span of 180 million years. Tell you what, Dr. Dan Biddle, founder of Genesis Apologetics, you shoot me an email and you let me know why you think that paleontologists think that a Coelophysis that they say died about 190 million years ago was killed by an asteroid those same scientists think hit 66 million years ago. Do you think the mainstream says this is a time-traveling asteroid? It went back in time to kill all the dinosaurs that ever lived? Was it the series finale of Star Trek The Next Generation? 
In addition, many of these layers filled with dinosaurs are stacked one on top of the other. As you expect from the result of deposition of sediments over geological time. So I might as well explain what the coloration on the map means. Purple is for Triassic, blue is for Jurassic, and green is for Cretaceous. The colors get lighter as that period goes on. So deep purple is only for the early Triassic, and the lightest purple is from the Radian stage, the last part of the Triassic. So again, they're keeping Mesozoic as a filter, and then just cycling through different groups of organisms, as if they're all supposed to have been killed in a single event. Only creationists think that the fossil record is largely a result of a single event. This isn't duel of the catastrophes, flood versus asteroid, winner take all. Could a single asteroid that hit over 1,500 miles away from the heart of this disaster zone really be responsible for all this? Stay tuned to find out. No, no it couldn't. And no one thinks it was. Like seriously, no one. This has got to be the flimsiest straw man in creationist history. I've said this before, but it bears repeating. Before you can seriously tackle an idea, you should be able to articulate it well enough that proponents of that idea would agree that your statement is in fact what they believe. If you can't do that, then you can't actually dispute the idea in question because you don't actually know what it is. If you want to dispute basically all of geology and taphonomy, that's great, but you'd better know what the conclusions that have been reached in those fields actually are. But then, of course, if you knew that much, there's a chance you just realize the Earth is in fact old, and that the Flood doesn't explain a single thing about it, because it absolutely did not happen. An asteroid hitting the Yucatan Peninsula would certainly have regional consequences that could easily spread over part of present-day Central America. But the billions of fossils in the middle of North America were buried in multiple mud, sand, and volcanic ash layers from successive watery events. Right, which isn't what an asteroid or global flood would do. An asteroid impact wouldn't result in much actual deposition of anything besides some tsunami near the coasts. And a flood would result in one or a few layers of turbidite with mostly the same composition. Instead, we have multiple strata, only some of which are turbidites, no worldwide turbidite deposit, and many deposits that show they cannot have formed under floodwaters, such as non-flocculated shale, limestone, stone with clear bioturbations, meaning they had to form slowly, deposits showing varves, which require still waters, fossil raindrops, fossilized tracks in sand, all of these cannot form in a flood. Now, they're not going to be formed by an asteroid impact either, but no one is making that claim. And some of these layers are hundreds of feet thick and stretch over multiple states in the U.S. How could a single asteroid falling well over a thousand miles away from the center of this area bury dinosaurs across 14 U.S. states under hundreds of feet of mud, sand, and volcanic ash? It couldn't, and no one thinks it did. For example, look at the Lance Formation. This geological unit spreads across several states and is packed with fossils of many sorts of land, air, and marine creatures, including small and large dinosaurs, pterosaurs, fish, mammals, crocodiles, lizards, snakes, turtles, birds, frogs, and salamanders. Okay, let's look at the Lance Formation. It's from the very last part of the Cretaceous. It was formed along the transition from braided streams to river deltas to the coast of the western interior seaway. It certainly wasn't a flood because while bioturbation is rare, the formation is almost entirely non-turbidite sandstone, although there is a lot of seismite, which forms as a result of earthquakes. It also includes brown-gray mudstone, which had to have resulted from still water with fine silt particles and also bits of chewed-up plants, which are present in it. It contains fossils throughout, but of particular interest is a bone bed made up almost entirely of Edmontosaurus and Nectens. The bone bed was created when an area that had already had Edmontosaurus skeletons that had been buried and decayed to the point of having no flesh formed. Then an earthquake caused liquefaction of the mud the bones were buried under, and this mud then drained to its current location, resulting in the bones being graded with the biggest at the bottom and the smallest at top. This could not be the result of the animals dying in a flood, because then they would have been buried as mostly articulated skeletons with no strong grading of the bones by size. Now dapper, you may say. Where did you get this information? Well, I'll tell you. I got it from a thesis called Depositional Model of a Late Cretaceous Dinosaur Fossil Concentration, Lance Formation, by Summer Rose Weeks. This paper was published by Loma Linda University, a Seventh-day Adventist and Young Earth Creationist school. It was approved by Leonard Brand, Arthur V. Chadwick, and Kevin E. Nick. I can't find much on Nick, but Brand and Chadwick are Young Earth Creationists. So apparently, the flood doesn't at all explain the lands formation, and that's according to young Earth geologists. It's quite obvious that entire ecosystems were buried here during Noah's flood. Professor R. Chadwick explains, Oh hey, Chadwick! 
Let's see if he contradicts the work of his own student that he approved of enough to let her use it to get her degree and publish. Well, the, the lance formation extends most of the way across Wyoming, and then it goes into South Dakota, and the names change to the Hill Creek Formation, and then it goes into Montana, and so South Dakota, Montana, and Wyoming, and then there's an equivalent formation up in Drumheller in Canada where they find the dinosaurs up there. And they're also finding these same dinosaurs up in Alaska. Well, some of the same animals, such as the aforementioned Edmontosaurus, but Alaska didn't have all of the same animals. For example, there are no Tyrannosaurus finds in Alaska, but we do find Nanoxaurus, a different Tyrannosauroid. Also, while there are no Triceratops in Alaska, we do find Pachyrhinosaurus, a different Ceratopsian. And hey, you know what source I use for that? PaleoDB.org, the same source this video uses for where fossils are found. So no, it's not true to say that the Maastrichtian fauna of Alaska is the same as that of the Lance Formation. Although there is some overlap. And actually, as it turns out, after some very recent reanalysis of the Edmontosaurus specimens from Alaska, they've turned out to be distinct enough to warrant not only a new species, but their own genus, Ugrunaluk. So, sorry there, Dr. Chadwick, you're either ill-informed or dishonest. Now, you're a professor of biology at Loma Linda University, so let my audience decide if it's ill-informed or dishonest. So, we're talking about a large part of North America. Uh, what caused all the dinosaurs to go extinct? You mentioned the, the asteroid, um, but now let's talk about from a Genesis paradigm. How do we explain that? When we look at the fossil record of dinosaurs, we find that they are killed off in layers also. We have, we have the Triassic kinds of dinosaurs here, and then we have the Jurassic kind of dinosaurs higher up. And then we have the Cretaceous kind of dinosaurs at the very top. Kind of the exact thing you wouldn't expect from a flood, since floods tend to just jumble things from their entire extent together, regardless of environment. Let's take as an example the Tigris River in modern-day Iraq. This river floods irregularly, but let's imagine a particularly bad flood. The river starts up in the mountains. It washes down into what is now farmland, but would otherwise contain trees, grasses, etc. Then as it loses some volume and goes through areas that are mostly just desert, it picks up some volume from Lake Terthar, goes through some much wetter area, and eventually empties into a marshy delta at the northeast end of the Persian Gulf. So if this were to flood, we would expect plants and animals from all the environments involved to all be deposited together in a graded turbidite deposit. Because while the debris would be picked up sequentially as it goes, it all gets mixed in, as the head of the flood waters is what picks up most of it in the first place. So when the flood is over, there should be no ecological zonation. And right at the very top, we find Tyrannosaurus rex and these duck-billed dinosaurs and the kind of things we're studying in Wyoming because we're just right below that layer which ends the Cretaceous. And uh, so I think this process of burial couldn't just be explained by a single asteroid. Yeah, but the question wasn't, can a single asteroid explain the entirety of the Mesozoic? Because that's stupid, and no one thinks it does explain that. It has to involve something, dare I say, much bigger than that, mm. and uh, certainly on a grander scale, that encompasses the whole Earth. Okay, so this right here contradicts that paper that Dr. Chadwick himself signed off on in September 2016. Now, I have been unable to find anything about when this interview took place exactly. I called Dr. Chadwick up on the phone and asked, and he said it was late 2016 or early 2017, but couldn't really remember. Now, I suspect, but cannot demonstrate, that this means that it was after September when the interview took place. If that's the case, if that's the case, then his signing off on the paper by Summer Rose Weeks means that he knew that the fossil record of dinosaurs was not caused by something global, and that in some cases it required a long time to form and still tranquil waters. Or it means he knowingly signed off on bad research. That means that Dr. Chadwick has just committed academic fraud. Either he changed his mind at some point around late 2017, and fail to retract his earlier statements, or he is simply endorsing contradictory views in different outlets. Either of these is academic fraud. Dr. Chadwick has just removed himself from the rank of scholars and now stands firmly in the charlatan category. This is how it will stand until and unless he retracts either his views in Weeks 2016 or his views in Is Genesis History. As a result, Chadwick is not worthy of his doctorate and I will no longer refer to him as if he had such a degree. And uh, we find evidence for this in the, in the direction of currents that are flowing over the surface of the Earth. For example, in the rocks, 
if you've ever seen cross bedded sandstone, it's sandstone that lies at an angle like this. That sandstone tells us which direction the current was moving that deposited that sand. If we look at these flow of currents over the surface of the earth and in all these different layers of rock from the Cambrian all the way up to the, to the top, we find out that it seems to be going the same way over wide areas of the earth. So here's the problem with that. Chadwick is cherry picking his own data. He's not even misrepresenting just the consensus, he's misrepresenting his own research. Chadwick himself researched and published a data set containing thousands of data points on paleo currents from around the world, and he found no stronger continent scale directionality in them than we see today for any time period. In every case where you check the paleo currents on any given continent in a particular point in the stratigraphic column, less than half of paleo currents are in the supposed preferred direction. Sure, it's sometimes most or more than, say, a quarter of the rivers were going in one direction or another, but so what? Look at South America. Nearly all the rivers tend to go from west to east. You know why? Because the continent kind of slopes to the west. You know, because of the Andes. Similarly, in much of the eastern seaboard of the United States, most rivers flow west to east, but get across the Appalachians and they go east to southwest. Because, you know, the Appalachians. So even if his own data didn't disprove him, they would still be unremarkable. Except that we'd have to wonder why most currents during the Mesozoic were so dominated by single mountain ranges. Turns out we don't have to wonder that, because they weren't. Now, I want to give a thank you to Vice Rhino, who did a lot of the legwork on this one for me, as well as Corporal Anon, who found the raw data for me and pointed me towards Vice Rhino. In fact, above is a link to a video where Vice Rhino does a much deeper dive on this. And with that, I think I will leave it for today. This video may actually be worse than the video I call the worst creationist video ever in my 1000 subscriber special. Anyway, we'll be back for more in part two. Remember to like, comment, share the video, and if you're not already subscribed, go ahead and do that. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you're always notified when there's more Dapper Dino content. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Hovind, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, and Bob Knob. Their support helps make this channel possible, because as you may know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and they give this channel much needed additional stability. If you'd like to join the team, a link to my Patreon page can be found in the description, and you can join with the button right below this video on YouTube. Both groups of people get access to my special patron and member only Discord channel, links to new videos before I release them to the public, as well as a pretty direct line to me. They also often are asked to do things like vote on new video topics. If a monthly subscription isn't something that you'd like to do but you'd still like to help out the channel, I also have a Teespring store that has Dapper Dino merch, including mugs, blankets, pillowcases, shirts, all sorts of things. And if none of those things are for you, then please just remember to like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and share the video. All of those things really do help the channel grow. Well, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur.